I want to say a hearty amen to everything that Josh Brake just said. He is exactly, exactly right. My hope and by prayer when we gather is that we gather to worship and not talk about God as though he's not in the room. Uh, my heart and my desire is for us to engage with him because he is in the room in whatever he wants to do. Amen? And so I appreciate uh, your spirit and I'm just mindful, as the word says in Hebrews chapter 11, that the Lord um, earnestly rewards those who seek him in faith, meaning he responds to you just coming to seek him and he will meet you where you are as you are. Can I get an amen to that? And so I'm so grateful just for uh, Josh reminding of the, us of this time uh, in so many ways. Well, it is about this time every year that I think about a boy who was in the car with his dad. They were riding to a Christmas Eve service. His father was a pastor at a local church, and the boy just piped up and said to his dad on the way, Dad, are you going to explain Christmas to us again this year, or are you just going to let us enjoy it? And I just want to go on the record as saying that I cannot do justice explaining Christmas. It is something beyond words. But all I know is that our world is different because he's come. And so we're spending a few weeks this particular month just exploring how Jesus, some of his words and some of his actions, all of his actions and all of his words, but really how his actions and his words have impacted our world in some ways over the last 2,000 years. Last weekend, I visited with you about how Jesus made history for the sick, how his coming, how he responded to the sick, and what he taught about the sick altered the world and how it would respond from that for point forward in terms of how it responded to the sick and the assumptions it made about the sick. Jesus turned everything upside down. If you missed that message, I hope that you get online and watch or listen to it. This weekend, I'm going to return to another group that he changed the game for, that he made history for, and it's a group that's often at the center of our Christmas celebrations it's children. Now, in the ancient world of Greece and Rome, the two most dominant civilizations uh, of Jesus' day, children were at the bottom of the social ladder. In fact, it was not uncommon at all for a baby to go unnamed for a little while, and until that child was named, it the child was considered more like a plant or more like an animal. In both Greek and Latin, the word for child simply means not speaking. As in, they weren't to speak. As in, children are to only be seen, but not heard. In that day, a child, unless the child was born royalty. In that day, a child wasn't seen as significant. And here's why. Because they hadn't done anything yet. And the ancient world had an honor system entirely based on achievement and accomplishment. The primary way you had dignity was you achieved something. You did something. You accomplished something. In ancient culture, a child wasn't significant because they didn't make anything happen. They hadn't accomplished anything. They hadn't done anything. That's why when you get into the world of, of Greek fables and Greek myths like Hercules, there are stories about Hercules strangling two poisonous snakes in his crib when he was a baby. That was the only way Hercules had dignity as a baby, was he killed snakes in his crib as a baby. That's how they gave him dignity. It's because children were at the bottom of the social ladder and had no dignity in the eyes of the culture that there was a practice called exposure, where you could leave your newborn out to die in the elements. It was not against the law. Nobody could prosecute you. You could do that. If the family was poor, if a child was illegitimate, if the child was disabled, if the child was a girl, it was totally free and totally permissible to leave them at the city dump, to just expose them to the elements. 
and just leave it to the gods as to whether or not they live or die. And because the child was left at the dump, the child could be freely picked up and claimed by someone else like the child was a piece of scrap metal. And often that child might be raised to be a slave or sold as a slave. All this to say, children had no protection. Children had no dignity in the ancient world of the Roman Empire, the Greco-Roman Empire, in the days of Jesus. Now stop and think about how Jesus came into the world for a second. The Gospels record stories of Jesus as a child. But there's no story in the Gospels of Jesus ever performing a miracle. In fact, some people just couldn't stand it in the early church. In the second and third century, there were actually stories that were being made up about Jesus exercising great power as a child, making clay birds come to life, or magically causing the death of other children. People just couldn't stand it. That if Jesus was Jesus, he had to have done some miracles as a child. And when the truth is, the closest thing you see to Jesus doing anything extraordinary when he's a child is when he's in the temple at 12 years of age and he's asking questions that none of the religious leaders can answer. That's about it. The point is, Jesus came into the world as a child at the bottom of the social ladder. It even looked like he was illegitimate when you consider that Mary is pregnant before she and Joseph get married. The whole Christmas story Jesus has the, stack, has the chips stacked against him. He's born under this cloud of suspicion to a poverty-stricken couple. And, and, and not only that, he's birthed in, in a stable or a cave of some kind because there's no room for him in the inn. He's got a king named Herod who's hunting him down, trying to kill him. He's at the mercy of, of young parents who are being guided by angels and dreams running for their life as a refugee to Egypt And he lives as a refugee for the first years of his life in Egypt. Jesus is far from strangling any snakes in his crib. Everything is happening to him. He's making nothing happen. He came into the world with no dignity as a powerless baby. And yet he had a dignity bestowed upon him from out of this world. But when Jesus becomes an adult, he begins to turn the ladder upside down for children And he begins to say radical things like this. It doesn't sound radical to you because you live in a world that for the most part has protected children in Western civilization. So this doesn't seem like a big deal to you. This was strange when Jesus first said it. At that time, the disciples came to Jesus and asked, who is the greatest in the kingdom of heaven? He called a little child and had him stand among them. And he said, I tell you the truth, unless you change and become like little children, you'll never enter the kingdom of heaven. Therefore, whoever humbles himself like this child is the greatest in the kingdom of heaven. You got to stop right there. When Jesus said this, nobody talks like this. He uses a child as a positive example of what it looks like to receive the kingdom of heaven. Never before had anybody, including Jewish rabbis in the literature, used children in such a lofty way. Let's just move on. Keep moving through the passage, Matthew 18, 5. And whoever welcomes a little child like this in my name welcomes me. Jesus is upping the ante even more. He's saying that, hey, if you welcome a child in my name, you're welcoming me. Verse 6. But if anyone causes one of these little ones who believe in me to sin, it would be better for him to have a large millstone hung around his neck and to be drowned in the depths of the sea. Now he's saying a child is of such significance that those who lead them into sin will be held severely accountable. You're not done yet. Jump down to verse 10. See to it that you do not look down on one of these little ones. For I tell you that their angels in heaven always see the face of my Father in heaven. By the way, all the talk about kids having guardian angels, it's rooted in this verse. Just in case you were wondering. For all of you who's always asked me, now where is that in the Bible? This is where it is. Make a note. Here, Jesus comes so far as to say children have angels. And here's the deal. They haven't achieved anything yet. Isn't it those who achieve that have the attention of the gods, of Zeus? That's what the Romans say. That's what the Greeks said. 
Only those who achieve have the attention of God's. But now, Jesus says, oh no, children, they have angels. In fact, let me tell you this. The, the, the angels that are overseeing children, apparently, this is the imagery Jesus gives, they're, they sit so close to the throne, they can see the face of God. The idea being, it is the angels overlooking kids that actually are in closest proximity to the throne. That's the picture he's giving here. Stunning stuff. I just took you to one passage. This is one passage out of Matthew 18 where he's just unraveling this teaching on children. And you know what? It's washing right over his disciples because we're all like the disciples. It takes us a while to get it. Look at what happens just one chapter later in Matthew 19, verse 13. Then people brought little children to Jesus for him to place his hands on them and pray for them. Boy, that's a beautiful image, isn't it? But the disciples rebuked them. Jesus said, let the little children come to me. Do not hinder them, for the kingdom of heaven belongs to such as these. See, the disciples, they still don't get it. Kids are being brought to Jesus for him to lay, their hand, lay his hands on them and touch them, pray for them. And the disciples are like, get away from us, kids. You bother us. You get out of his way. Don't be bothering him like that. The disciples are having trouble getting it. And Jesus has to correct the disciples. I love what John Ortberg says. John Ortberg said this, children had a kingdom they belonged to long before Walt Disney ever came along. And it should be noted that before Jesus came along, I will say this, the Old Testament does have a bit to say about the preciousness of children. The Psalms are a primary example of this. You can read this throughout the Psalms. That's why the Jews were against the exposure practices of all the people in the Greco-Roman Empire. They were. But without question, it was a Jew named Jesus his actions and his teaching that over time led to a fundamental shift in the attitude of, of, of humanity and civilization about children. Why him? I think it's because he walked out of the grave and no other teacher has ever done that. And when Jesus was raised from the dead, that caused everybody to do a double take on everything he said and did before he was dead. Because they began to realize that really was the Son of God in Jesus of Nazareth that was telling us how it is. And he brought children into a whole new light. What Jesus taught about children shaped his early followers. Decades after Jesus comes along, the apostle James writes this in James 1 and 27. Religion that God our Father accepts as pure and faultless is this to look after orphans and widows in their distress and to keep oneself from being polluted by the world. The ancient world was full of orphans. And James writes this. As early as the second century in the Roman Empire, the church began to care for children in organized ways, in organized communities. It was the early church that came up with the whole idea of orphanages. It's thought that in the third century, around 270 AD, that the man Nicholas was born in a town of Asia Minor, the town of Patera. And his parents died during a plague when he was but a teenager. And at the time of their passing, he was already part of a Christian community there in Patera. They took him under their wings. His parents had left behind a little bit of money for him and while Nicholas was spiritually raised by this community of believers, he became a minister of the gospel of Jesus Christ himself. Eventually he matured. Much later, he was elected to be a bishop of Myra or elder over the church in the region of Myra. And his leadership was most noted for his campaigning for the protection of starving, neglected children. Eventually, they came to call him a saint, Saint Nicholas. The early Catholics in Europe proclaimed him as the patron saint of neglected children. And slowly a feast called the Feast of St. Nicholas rose up long after he passed 
began to be celebrated along with Christmas throughout Europe among the Catholics. And that's how he eventually got incorporated into the traditional Christmas celebrations we know of today. Of course, he's become something entirely different. Santa Claus. But if you strip away all the commercial veneer, if you strip away the urban legends that have been attached to him, if you get to the origin of it, you'll find that at the heart of the legend of Santa Claus is the story of a Christ follower born in 270 AD who cared for children in need. By the fourth century, there was a Roman emperor who had himself come to faith in Jesus Christ. And you know what that Roman emperor did? He outlawed the practice of exposure for the entire Roman Empire. No longer could you leave children at a dump to die. Over time, instead of children being left in the elements, people began to leave them outside monasteries and churches. And eventually that gave rise to what you think of as orphanages. Today, so much of our world views children differently than the way the world was viewing children before Jesus came along. And there's still so much work to be done on behalf of children in our world. We're all aware of that. But today, there are countless numbers of even secular, nonprofit organizations, not to mention local, state, federal efforts on behalf of children today. And while there are many in our country and our world who have yet to believe in Jesus as the Son of God, they nevertheless live in the midst of a culture that believes in children, and that is because of Jesus, the one whom they have yet to believe in. There's still so much work left to be done, I know that. But it's just worth stopping and considering how much different our world is. Because he came. He came into the world as a child. And because of that, he's made a difference for children that would come after him. And so that's one of the reasons why I sing the song this time of the year. And I say, let earth receive her king and celebrate his birth. And one of the ways you receive the king is by responding to a child in the way that he would. It's why we celebrate and promote and fund the work of Touch a Life in Ghana. Out of our offering, we fund the, the drilling of water wells and the building of orphanages through Christian Relief Fund, the sponsor of orphans in Somalia and Kenya. It's why we do what we do at Thanksgiving and why we do what we do at Christmas with our SAC Hunger programs and with the Angel Tree and with the stocking of the toy store and Metrocrest services, which so many of you have been faithful to support. It's why we've been providing Christmas for hundreds of needy families in our community around our campuses for many years. It's why some of you give a portion of your lives every year to serve in our children's ministry. It's why others of you have prayed and labored for the sake of the unborn. And it's why others of you have prayed and labored in the world of fostering and others of you have adopted. A few weeks ago, I had the privilege of attending the adoption proceeding at a courthouse of a couple in our small group, Bob and Michelle Pritchard. They were adopting a little boy named Isaiah who they've been fostering for some time. Here are, in fact, a few pictures. I'll just let you see. That's on the right, Bob and Michelle. They have three daughters. One of their daughters is not in the picture, but here are two, Sydney on the left, Ariel on the right, and there is little Isaiah in his Christmas outfit. I'm digging those threads he's wearing. Our entire small group have been a part of this journey. We have learned and been a part of it, and little Isaiah has become a part of our small group. He's the only person under 18 in our small group. He's been a part of our small group for the last couple of years, and it's been an unbelievable journey just to come alongside and to see that sacred moment in that courtroom where some commitments are made and some questions are asked. And I'll tell you this, you know, there are plenty of unplanned pregnancies in the world, but I'm going to tell you what, there's no such thing as an unplanned adoption. And I'll say this to my brothers and sisters in the room who've been adopted, and maybe you've walked through a challenging journey of self-awareness of wondering about your origins and why you were given up. Maybe you have dealt with the temptation to believe that you weren't wanted, but I would just remind you, there's no such thing as an unplanned adoption. It took work, it took effort, and it took desire for every single child to be adopted that's been adopted so far. 
There's no such thing as an unplanned adoption. That little boy, Isaiah, is a wanted boy. I want to leave you with three takeaways for today in light of this message about how Jesus has made history for children. The first is this. I just want to say, for those of us with children at home, this is not a call to be child-centered in our parenting. It's a call to be Christ-centered in our parenting. You may be thinking in this message, oh, this is calling us to be more child-centered. Absolutely not. We're called to be Christ-centered in our parenting. Jesus came and recovered the treasure that children are for our world, but they are to be treasured and not worshipped. There is only one who is worthy of worship. And we're called to help our children orient their lives around him, Jesus of Nazareth. And ultimately, if we enable them to to orient their lives around anyone or anything else other than Jesus, are we truly helping them in the end? Are we really doing what's best for them? I really don't think most of our children in our immediate community, just among us in our church, I don't think most of our children are in danger of being neglected in terms of health care or education or food today. But if we're providing for our children in every way without having a plan and working a rhythm to consistently expose them to the way who is Jesus, then we may be neglecting them far more than we realize. And I just want to encourage those of us with children at home, as we go into 2023, I just want to ask you to pray and to ponder, what will it mean for you to be a little more Christ-centered in your parenting in 2023? Because one of the greatest gifts you can give your child is not a sense of self-worth. The greatest gifts you can give your child involve giving them a sense of Christ-worth how much they are worth to Jesus. He died for them. That's how much they're worth. And there are things that he can do for them that you can't do for them. There are things that he can give them that I can't give them. And the greatest gift we can give to our children is consistently bringing them to Jesus. And speaking of that, For those of us who have children that are grown, it's still not too late to bring our children to the king. Some of us may have children right now who are traveling a difficult road. They're in a valley or a desert or a wilderness. Maybe even there are a few who won't give us much of a hearing right now. But they can't keep you from going over their heads to the father. They can't keep you from dropping prayer bombs on their head. I say that in love, man. You know. We even raised our boys to do that. We've told them in the past, if you don't like something we've decided, you can go over our heads and talk to God about it. You know, he, he has his ways of getting a hold of us. And by the way, we've had to come back and apologize to some things for doing some things wrong with them in the past and ask their forgiveness. So believe me, if, if you're a kid, an adult kid or a kid, and you're frustrated with your folks right now, let me encourage you, it is okay for you to go over their heads and pray about them for a little while. Talk to God about it, and talk to God about you and your heart. But I would just say, if you've got adult children right now, and they're in a hard place, I would tell you, it's no one's ever too old to be brought to Jesus. One of the most beautiful prophecies about the coming of Jesus is found in the very last chapter of the very last book of the Old Testament. Malachi 4, verses 2 and 6 uh, prophesies about Jesus. The son of righteousness will rise with healing in its rays. He will turn the hearts of their parents to their children and the hearts of the children to their parents. In just a moment, I'm going to give us a a chance to do this. Uh, Hopefully you read my weekly email this week, and in the email I gave you some coaching. I encouraged you to bring a a picture with you to service, maybe even to have it ready on your phone. It could be a digital picture. It could be a hard copy. You're not leaving it with us. I just wanted you to have it with you in this service because in just just a moment, we're going to spend a couple moments, we're going to bring 
our children to the king. Be they young or old, we're gonna bring them to the king. And so you could be looking for that on your phone or getting that ready. I want it in your hands. I want you to be able to look at them as we bring them to the king. We're gonna bring them to Jesus. We're gonna ask God to touch them, to bless them, to reach them, to move in their life. We're gonna ask God to tear down some walls and break through some barriers. So I'll give you a chance to do that. But let me leave you with one last thing, and it's this. I want to encourage us all, let's let our identity be rooted in this, that we are God's child through Jesus, through Jesus Christ. Let your identity be rooted in that. This is one of the chief reasons why he came. John chapter 1 and verse 12, John writes, Yet to all who did receive him, to those who believed in his name, he gave the right to become children of God. Children born not of natural descent, nor of human decision or a husband's will, but born of God. One of the greatest gifts Jesus brings is a sense of your identity. You know, you and I live in a world that encourages us to attach our sense of identity and significance to all sorts of things. Some of us have a tendency to derive our identity from what we own or what we drive or what kind of job we have or what others think of us. Others of us have our sense of identity tied to whether or not we get married or who we're married to or if we have children or how our children turn out. There's all kinds of default ways Default wells you drink from to try and derive your sense of identity. And I just would remind you that you do well to remember Jesus was never married, nor did he have children, wealth, or much success at all by earthly definitions. He wound up on a cross, but he knew who he was. He was God's son. And because he knew who he was, he was the freest person of all. He had a dignity that was bestowed upon him from out of this world, and you do too. You have a dignity that's bestowed upon you from out of this world, an intrinsic value. Your value is not extrinsic, meaning your value is not tied to the utilitarian function that you can perform for others. Your value is not tied to simply what you can accomplish or achieve. Your value is intrinsic. Your value is tied because of what God has declared over you and what God has done for you in Jesus Christ. You have a dignity that's bestowed upon you from out of this world. And like I mentioned a couple of weeks ago in that grand song we sing, every, every, every month, basically, of December, we sing that song, O Holy Night, and we get to that epic line of he appeared, Jesus appeared, and the soul felt its worth. And knowing whose you are can make the biggest difference in the world for you, in you, and through you. There's an old story out of the Bronx in New York from early in the 20th century. There was a massive apartment fire. One of the New York City firefighters, all the ladders were taken up. He was trying to get to the third story of these apartments. He climbed up this scalding hot drain pipe that was on the exterior of the apartment building. And even though he had some very thin gloves, I mean, it, it was just, his hands were being burned even as he was climbing up the scalding hot drain pipe. He was trying to get to a child who was just leaning out the window trying to breathe. When he got to that child, he managed to get that child in his arms. And that child came around on his back and just wrapped his arms around his neck and held on. And that firefighter began to climb back down that scalding hot drain pipe. His, his hands were grotesquely burned. And the moment he hit the ground, authorities took the child from him and he was ushered off to local hospital, separated from the child. Later he learned that the child's parents perished in the apartment fire. So he wound up making an appeal to the city of New York that the child be entrusted to him. There was quite a debate in the city as to what to do. Judges were involved. Courts were involved. But it's said that as the firefighter began to show up at the proceedings and make his case, there was a, the winds changed. As more and more people came to know the story of how that boy was rescued. And it said that the judge eventually rendered the boy into the firefighter's custody one afternoon saying, the child belongs to the one with the scars. 
And I would say, so do we. The one who came as a child made it possible for all of us to be sons and daughters of the Most High. We really do belong to the one with the scars. So I want to close right now with a time of prayer. And I want to invite you to grab that picture that maybe you slid into your Bible or that's in your purse that you have in your pocket or maybe you've got it on your device and to pull up a picture of two of your child or your children. And if you're sitting with your children right now, I want to encourage you just to lay a hand on them. And I want us to take a few moments and I want us to bring our children, our grandchildren to the king. I want to encourage you right now just to bow your head. You can look at that picture or maybe your hand is on your child next to you. And I just want to go ahead and ask you, is there anything concerning you right now about them and what they're facing in life? And I want to encourage you right now in your heart, in your mind, just to talk to the Lord about it. And go ahead and just as you bring them to Jesus, go ahead and, and say in your own finite mind, just with your limited perspective, go ahead and confess that. Just say, here's what I would desire you to do for them, Jesus, or to do to them or to do in them. I just surrender them to your will, but go ahead and talk to him about it right now. Go ahead and while you're at it, ask the Lord to give you wisdom for how to relate to them. If there's something you don't know what to do about or you're not quite sure the way forward, just ask for wisdom. The Lord promises to give wisdom to all generously without finding fault. Ask for wisdom. Some of you may be preparing to see adult children over the holidays. Maybe you know a conversation needs to be had or you're looking for an open door. Ask for the Lord to open that door according to Colossians 4, 2 through 4, to open a door for a conversation, to fill you with grace and wisdom for that moment. I want to give you an opportunity to pray as a child yourself to the Father. No matter how old you are, no matter how long you've walked with the Lord, you're still a child to the Father. What is it you would humbly ask him for as you approach him? What is it you would humbly ask him for Remember, Jesus teaches us in the prayer. He teaches us to pray. He teaches us to come to God and to call him Father. What would you humbly ask your Father for? And I want to say a word to any of us in my hearing. Maybe it's been a long time since you've been in any kind of environment like this. You saw that last 
passage about receiving Christ, you're not even sure if you've received Christ or what that is. All this is new to you. You don't even know where to begin. Or maybe it could be you've been gone for so long from the Father, you don't know where to begin. And I want to help you right now take a first step right where you are. I'm going to pray a prayer, and I'm just going to invite you to repeat it after me. It's just some words. They're not magic words. It's just a way to help you get the conversation started again with the Lord right now in this moment. And this is a prayer that all of us could pray again. But this is just a way of helping you get the conversation started because it is the Father's will to father you. He wants to father you. All of us have made decisions outside the will of God in our life, no one has ever made a decision that took us out of God's reach. So if you just want to turn your heart toward him, I just invite you just to repeat these words after me just as you're getting the conversation started again. Dear Jesus, my heart's most fundamental trust has been in other things in other people, in my own competency, my own understanding. And this has only gotten me into trouble. I confess that I'm a sinner and cannot save or redeem myself. As far as I know in my own heart, at this moment, I surrender it to you. I transfer my trust to you. And I ask that you would receive and accept me. Not for anything I've done, but because of everything you've done for me. This day I confess that I believe you are the son of God. The one who has been sent that I might have life. I am in need of you. Your life, your teachings, your death on the cross, your resurrection, your spirit. From this point forward, I desire to follow you as the Lord of my life and to learn how to live as a child of the Most High. And I just say to you, if you've prayed those words, I'd ask you in just a moment when we're dismissed, don't leave here without joining, finding one of us down front. We'll be receiving people to pray for a variety of things. But if you've prayed that prayer, we'd love to help you with next steps. Because every child belongs in a family and there's a family for you here. Lord, I thank you for your presence I thank you for the good news that you love our children even more than we do. I thank you that you are eager to receive our children as we bring our children and our grandchildren to you of all ages, asking you to touch and to bless them. And we are grateful that we as well can be your children through Jesus Christ. We long to learn how to live and operate out of that identity going forward. Jesus, thank you for coming the way you came to change the world for all of us. And we pray this in the mighty name of Jesus. Amen.